So hello, good afternoon. I'm Gaudenzio Menegesha, I'm the, the director of this department, and it is my pleasure uh, to welcome you to this uh, fourth uh, uh, distinguished lecture. So this is the fourth, and is uh, the one who closed our program of uh, distinguished lecture. So you are the last, but not the least. So we are looking forward to have uh, your excellent talk today. Uh, very briefly, I want uh, to thank you for coming here. I, I hope uh, the, the young students, especially in PhD and um, uh, those who are doing research, uh, I'm very happy to see you here because this is uh, mainly dedicated to you because you are uh, opening, you have to open your mind and to see for, uh, for the future. And you don't know yet what will be your future. So the, the more you open your vision, the more opportunity you will have. So this is why I'm happy to see many young people here today. So today we have uh, uh, Mustafa Kamash, who will talk to us about uh, cy cyber genetics, uh, building novel genetic feedback control system for living cells. And uh, it is my great pleasure to have you here. And I leave uh, Luca Scanato to give the right introduction to you. Thank you. Thank you for coming to this distinguished. It's uh, my honor to be the, the host of uh, Mustafa. And uh, he, I, have, I will give just a brief uh, introduction of you. He got his uh, uh, bachelor at the Texas AMM uh, in uh, 86 and a PhD from Rice uh, in 1990. And then he got uh, the, a position at uh, Iowa State where he created a dynamics and uh, control uh, program that uh, he led until 2002. And then he moved uh, to UC uh, Santa Barbara where uh, he, he was a device uh, 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 he served as vice chair of mechanical engineering and then a director of uh, control. And then in 2011, he moved uh, to ETH, where he's still uh, right now. And uh, I, he has uh, a remarkable and outstanding uh, CV. He's a fellow of the IEEE, he's fellow of the International Federation of Automatic Control, and also the Japan Society for uh, Science. Uh, um, communication, and uh, um, he got uh, recently an ERC advanced, uh, and he's also involved in two FAT open uh, projects. Uh, we just want to uh, say two words uh, where when I met uh, Mustafa, it was uh, like 15 years ago in Santa Barbara, more or less, and then at that time, uh, system biology uh, was, um, was a very uh, hot topic uh, in the control community. Everybody was, everybody, many people were working there. There were many, many invited sessions. But then eventually, you know, the low hanging fruit started uh, to, to, to finish and only the hard problem remained. And many people left basically this area. And uh, Mustafa instead, uh, he insisted, I think it was a really brave, uh, uh, brave move, but uh, eventually the, 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 all the hard work uh, paid off and uh, now he has a publication uh, in Nature and uh, the Royal Society. And I'm really happy to, to have him here, have him here and uh, so, show some uh, uh, really interdisciplinary work where the different areas, biology, control, systems, uh, also communication comes uh, to the same uh, same place. So I'll let uh, uh, Mustafa to uh, present uh, his, uh, his uh, presentation and uh, let's thank him again for coming here. Can you hear me? Okay, good. I'm going to start the timer here. Uh, again, uh, it's uh, my great pleasure and honor to be here today. Um, I, uh, I've been to Padua before. This is my second visit. And, and I think uh, it's always a joy for me to come to Italy, uh, no matter which part. Uh, but I'm very happy to be here again. And thank you very much for your invitation. There's, more, there's no more versatile molecule than DNA. Uh, nor are there any designs that are more consequential 
than those whose blueprints are encoded by this molecule. And you know, this exquisite substance has been shaped over billions of years by the creative forces of evolution. But it's only during our lifetime that we are beginning to understand and directly manipulate this remarkable molecule. So this gives us a lot of opportunity and a lot of power, but it also uh, requires a lot of responsibility. So what I'm going to tell you about today is our work in manipulating DNA in order to design uh, synthetic control systems and have them control the dynamics of living cells. Uh, this is a very new subject, uh, maybe I would say no older than 10 years or so. But a lot has happened in this uh, short time. So I'd like to give you a glimpse of it, and I'd also like to focus on our work. So we call this cybergenetics, this whole general area, we call it cybergenetics. So why cybergenetics? As you know, uh, cybernetics is a term that was co coined by Norbert Wiener in 1948. And Norbert Wiener had this great vision of unifying control and communication systems for man and machine. Right? But at the time of Norbert Wiener in the 1940s, even the structure of DNA wasn't completely understood. So a lot of the studies were involved in neuroscience. Nowadays, we have the abilities, we have the methods, we have the genetic techniques to be able to do much more. We can manipulate things at the genetic scale. So what, what we call cybergenetics is essentially cybernetics uh, at the gene level. And I will explain to you what that means. So why now? What made this possible now? There are several things that enabled uh, cybernetics, cybergenetics. Uh, one of them is, as I pointed out, is the ability for, to manipulate the genome. So now we can go into DNA and uh, manipulate its structure and its sequences. We can also apply inputs to living cells uh, that we weren't able to do before. We can use uh, chemical inducers, we can even use light as an excitation input. We can have our cells respond to these inputs. We also have devised uh, equipment and machines to be able to measure uh, the components and the states of living cells. And I'll talk about some of those things. So the combination of all of these technologies, as well as novel computational and um, uh, numerical methods, allowed us to, for the first time, to be able to uh, genetically build uh, new devices, including control systems. So why would we want to build feedback control systems in living cells? There are lots of reasons. Um, one, by building uh, synthetic control systems, we hope to get a better understanding of how um, natural cells endogenously uh, control their various species. Right? So we hope to get a deeper understanding of biology because when we build these systems, we find out where we fail and we will understand better what constraints the cells have. But there are also other industry applications in industrial biotechnology and medical therapy that are important. Uh, the next question is how. So how do we uh, control living cells? I'm going to tell you about three different ways. And let me just show them here. So in the first approach, we're looking at controlling a population of cells. Um, so if you think about uh, cellular population, so you have an aggregate variable like a protein output. We can measure it. And then we can take this measurement, feed it back to a computer where our control system lives, and then use the output of the control algorithm to drive uh, an input, for example, light. Right? Uh, in the second approach, we do a very similar thing, except we have a, one controller for each living cell. So we're actually controlling one cell at a time. And in the last uh, approach, we genetically engineer the control system so that the cells are being controlled autonomously by our synthetic control system. And it is this last approach that I will focus on throughout this talk. Right? So, all right, very good. I realize that uh, many of you are electrical engineers, uh, so am I. Uh, and so, uh, but you may not have uh, looked at biology in a long time. And so I'd like to give you, perhaps for the first 15 minutes or so, 
a gentle introduction to molecular biology, okay? I will just introduce the things that you need to understand the rest of the talk, and hopefully that will be enough for you to get an appreciation for how one would design uh, biological control systems. Okay, so if you think about a cell and what a cell does, um, well, a cell does lots of things, but one of the things that it does is respond to its environment. And one way it does this is by being able to sense a molecule or, or ligand uh, through a sensor at the surface, it's called the receptor. Once a cell senses this ligand, then there's a whole signaling uh, that is transduced called si through the signaling uh, pathway. And the outcome of the signaling, depending on what the signal is, could be a response. And this response could take any one of many forms. So it could be, for example, increased growth. It could be move and migrate. It could be differentiate to a new cell type. It could be increase or change the metabolism. Or it could be to commit suicide, so reprogrammed cell death. And cells do do that. Okay? It all depends on what sort of signal the cell receives from the outside. But if one looks closely at how this is achieved, if you look at the nature of the response, you will find very often at the heart of this response is gene expression. Okay? So this is the process where this DNA in the cell, uh, think about it as like a ticker tape that's storing the uh, response program. Um, this information is used to synthesize uh, cellular machinery like proteins that actually perform these functions that I mentioned. Okay? So at the heart of these responses is the process of gene expression. Gene expression is extremely important. I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about gene expression. And a lot of what we do is actually consists of controlling this important process. So again, this would be a review from high school biology. If you don't remember it, you're going to hear it again. So we have a sequence of uh, AGCT, four different nucleotides. That's part of the DNA. And a unit of that sequence is called the gene that encodes for a single protein. So the process of gene expression begins where a big molecule, like a reading head, RNA polymerase, uh, transcribes this information on the DNA to form the messenger RNA, okay? So this process is called transcription, when you go from DNA to messenger RNA. And the messenger RNA itself is then further processed by these ribosomes. Again, these are big molecular machines that read the sequences on the messenger RNA, and they create this, uh, uh, these uh, amino acid sequences which turn into uh, proteins. Okay, functional proteins. The proteins have to fold in the right three-dimensional structures bec before they can function, uh, but they are the output of this process. So the process of going from messenger RNA to functional proteins, that's called translation. And together, transcription and translation is what we refer to as gene expression. So the cell normally doesn't produce all the proteins that are encoded. They just produce these proteins in time in response to the external signals. So this is, think of this as a just-in-time manufacturing process. And of course, if you, have to, if you are to have an effective manufacturing process like this one, one should be able to uh, regulate it. So how is gene expression regulated? Um, well, it's regulated directly at the gene level, one of the, one of the several ways of, of regulating it. For example, you could have a molecule like a transcription factor uh, called an activator or a repressor. In this case, it's an activator that binds DNA in just the right place upstream from the, uh, from the gene of interest. And what this molecule does, it helps recruit this RNA polymerase, right? So with the activator there, you can imagine the affinity of the RNA polymerase to its binding site will be much stronger, and of course that induces uh, gene expression. Right? So this is one way to activate gene expression. If you want to do the opposite, if you want to repress gene expression, there's also other molecules that are inhibitors or repressors. So these molecules bind also in the promoter site, and what these molecules do, they essentially block RNA polymerase from continuing the transcription process. Okay, so you have uh, no transcription or very little transcription, and so you have small amount of uh, gene expression. So depending if you have an activator or a repressor, you're turning on a gene or turning it off. Right? So that's one way in which regulation happens 
at the molecular level. Um, now, how do we model such a process? Well, you can think about transcription as a birth process. And mRNA, of course, degrades. It has a certain half-life. So that's another reaction in which a molecule of mRNA will degrade. And so we can represent transcription and degradation as two chemical uh, uh, reactions, uh, one with the rate k sub r, the other one with the rate gamma sub r. Similarly, for translation, we also have a process of uh, translation with a particular rate and also degradation of cellular proteins. And again, here there are two other reactions. The only difference is that now here the mRNA, once it gets translated, the same mRNA can be translated many times, so it's not destroyed by this chemical reaction, uh, but you can get uh, amplification of this mRNA. So think of this as like an amplifier, where the one molecule of DNA produces several mRNA molecules. Each one of them leads to producing hundreds or thousands of uh, protein molecules. So this is like a high-gain amplifier. And um, transcription and translation are the two essential parts. We can model this deterministically using ordinary differential equations. It's not difficult to write this down. So here you can see that R dot, so the rate of production of RNA, is some constant minus the degradation rate, and similarly for the protein. Um, now, the constant of transcription, K sub R, uh, of course, depends on whether this gene is control is activated or repressed. So if you have an activator, as I showed you before, then uh, K sub R would be a monotonically increasing function of the activator concentration in the cell. And if you have a repressor, it's a monotonically decreasing function. Uh, many genes are actually being transcribed at a constant rate. We call this uh, uh, constitutive expression. Right? So it, it doesn't respond to the concentration of activators and repressors. So it's always uh, being produced constitutively at a constant rate. And all three uh, gene types are, actually exist. Uh, one question is, if you want to do something quantitative, if you want to, certainly if you want to do control, how would you go about measuring how much proteins your cell has? And the answer comes from actually a very creative discovery. Uh, that led to the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2008. And so uh, this is the fellow that actually discovered uh, this uh, special protein called the green fluorescent protein. And he isolated it from jellyfish. So this is uh, Shimamura. And you can see him holding a test tube with this fluorescent protein. So essentially, he noticed that jellyfish uh, expressed this fluorescent substance, and he isolated it. And that's GFP. And for that, he and two of other colleagues um, uh, got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry. And this has literally revolutionized molecular biology. Right? This allowed you to, do, to quantify and measure and understand you know, what the cells are doing and how they're doing it. So the way in which this GFP uh, made a difference is actually quite simple. So imagine you have a gene of interest that you're interested in quantifying. Let's say you want to know its protein product, where it is, how much of it there is. So what you do is you genetically engineer a sequence that encodes for that fluorescent protein. Uh, you could either do, do it upstream or downstream. So you either do it after the gene or right before. Right? And when, when this gene is actually expressed, what happens is that you get your protein. Let me just switch to this one. You get your protein. In this case, I call it RC. But attached to it, you have another protein, which is that fluorescent protein. Right? And you can imagine that the fluorescence of that cell will be proportional to the abundance of that protein of interest. So you can relate the intensity of fluorescence to the amount or concentration of the protein inside a given cell. So this way, you will know how much of that protein there is, and you'll know also where it is. Of course, you have to first check that by fusing uh, your, G your protein of interest with a fluorescent protein like a GFP, you don't affect its function. Usually, people have to, to test that. But once you do test, then you know you have a good measure of the uh, abundance and the quantity. Here's an example. Uh, these are live cells where you can see where these proteins aggregate. Uh, there's a fluorescing my mouse. Um, now, for, for us, uh, I, I would like to just point out that you can also see this I I under the microscope. So you can quantify the fluorescence under the microscope. There's also another device called the flow cytometer that allows you to create a histogram of the various cells and their intensity, which will reflect the distribution of proteins from one cell to the next. 
So anyway, this is how we quantify, one of the ways by which we quantify proteins. And um, however, if you do experiments, as we do, and you look under the microscope, you find out that even though you have cells that are genetically identical, in other words, they have the same DNA sequence, uh, the individuals are not exactly the same, which is kind of strange because these cells have exactly the same DNA sequence, they're in the same conditions, they see the same temperature, the same nutrients, uh, but if you look really, really closely, you'll find that these cells express different amount of fluorescence, okay? And this is an image uh, under the microscope. There are actually cells here in the dark. Uh, you can't see them. And, and even the ones you do see, some are brighter than others, right? So what lies behind this variability, okay? So uh, it turns out, uh, you know, studying chemical reactions inside a living cell is not like uh, studying chemical reaction in a chemistry lab where you have Avogadro's number worth of molecules. So inside of living cells, cell, you know, the molecules are present in very low copy numbers. You have one gene, maybe a handful of mRNAs. Uh, so you can't also model them as continuous concentrations, as continuous variables, because they appear in discrete quantities, you know, one copy, two copies, three copies, and so on. And a third aspect is that the nature of chemical reactions inside a living cell is not deterministic. So the, due to the thermal energy, these molecules are moving around, and a reaction happens only when the right reactions collide with each other. And so because of that, the order of the reactions and the nature of the reaction is actually a random variable, right? Uh, so we have to take this into account. So if you take these three factors together in combination, the randomness, the random nature of chemical reactions, the fact that molecules come in whole numbers, the discrete variables, and the fact that uh, they're often very scarce, now, this uh, brings about uh, a st very stochastic nature of, of chemical reactions that you simply don't see in a test tube, in regular chemistry. And so if you look at a single cell, for example, it may be the concentration of a particular protein over time, you may have this piecewise constant concentration, uh, but a neighboring cell which has a, exactly the same DNA subjected to the same uh, environment could have a different piecewise constant, right? and a third cell also uh, a different one still. So this will uh, give, us, give rise to variability, not only uh, in the same population over time, but also variability in the same cell over time. And whereas a deterministic model uh, will represent concentration as one, uh, one trace, as you see here, uh, for a stoch stochastic representation actually allows you to uh, account for this variability, okay? So a probabilistic approach is then needed to model gene expression. So now here's our, uh, our gene expression. So instead of looking at concentrations and ODEs, we look at the abundance of mRNA and DNA as discrete random variables, right? And then uh, every reaction event, each firing of the reaction will, co will consist of one transcription event. So you have a birth of one mRNA molecule or a degradation of one protein molecule. And in, in this case, so X sub R and X sub P are discrete random variables. Uh, now we talk about the probability that a transcription event happened in a given time increment as being the transcription rate multiplied <coughs> by that time increment, or the probability that a single mRNA is degraded in a time increment H is given by uh, again, the rate of degradation times the time increment itself times the abundance of the mRNA molecules at that time, right? So if you have 10, twice as many mRNA molecules, you'll have twice, you're twice as likely that one of them will degrade. So the abundance at a given time enters into uh, the degradation rate. And so this way, uh, you can represent this process. And if you think about it, what I have just described is a continuous time discrete state Markov uh, chain, right? So that's, what, that's the model that we will adopt uh, in, in this lecture. And of course you can uh, compute the sum of the statistics, you can look at the mean and the variance and so on, higher order statistics, and those are described by continuous deterministic differential equations, uh, even though the species that they describe are themselves discrete. Okay, um, now with this model, it is possible to imagine why genetically identical cells can, give, can have different mRNAs or different proteins at the same amount of time. 
because this way you can think about each cell as a different sample path, right, or a different trajectory in this stochastic process. Okay, okay very good. Uh, one can generalize this. So this is what the simulations look like. You can do Monte Carlo simulations for transcription and translation. And you can generate lots and lots of sample paths, and you can compute the statistics. You can generalize this to any set of chemical reactions. You can generalize the standard deterministic chemical kinetics to stochastic version. You have n species. I'm going to go this, over this quickly, but just to give you an idea that it's not just gene expression that you can describe this way. So now if you have two species, then the state space is, instead of being uh, the first orthant, it's now this uh, infinite integer lattice. Right? where on one axis is the population of the first species, the other axis is the population of the second species. And there are M reactions. Uh, let's say you have three reactions, for example, here. Birth of S1, S1 combines with S2 to degrade the molecule of S2, and so on. These reactions are like transitions. right? And whenever any one of these reactions fires, you have a transition in the state space. So for example, when the first reaction fires, then uh, you have one extra molecule of S1, and S2 is unchanged. So you have a stoichiometry vector, which is 1, 0. And that corresponds to a transition to the right by 1. So you have an increase of S1. Uh, when the second reaction fires, basically you lose one molecule of S2. So the stoichiometry vector is 0, negative 1. And that's a transition in this direction. And similarly for S3. Now, for a model like this, you need to also figure out what the transition intensity is for this Markov process. And that depends on the state, right? So the more molecules you have, the higher the probability that this reaction comes. So the intensity is given by this function uh, called the propensity function, which is state dependent. Um, so here are some examples for those two reactions. And one sample path would be just simply a transition in the trajectory in the state space. Um, now, I, I'm not going to get into any of the details. I just want to give you a flavor for this. So if you didn't understand this completely, don't worry about it. The only thing you should keep from this discussion is that in order to describe this chemical system, uh, it's enough to just keep track of these stoichiometry vectors by stacking them next to each other into this stoichiometry matrix. And it's very easy to write down. If you know what the reactions are, you can easily write down the stoichiometry. And then this uh, other vector, which gives you the intensity of the transitions. right? So that kind of contains the reaction rate information. OK, so that's all you need to keep in mind uh, for what comes next. All right, let's now switch gears a little bit and talk about genetic engineering. How do we build controllers inside cells that we can't even see with our naked eyes? Right? Um, we certainly don't have small tweezers. We don't go in with but We have to figure out better ways. Uh, if you look at the inside a cell, it has a genetic substance, which is DNA. But there's also this um, circular DNA called plasmids. Right? So plasmids are circular DNA. They look something like this. You can encode the genetic structure in that sequence, usually a few genes at a time. And uh, yeah, these are just very similar to the endogenous DNA. So you have the sequence of A's, G's, C's, and T's. And the interesting thing is that these plasmids can be synthetically designed, right? So you can synthetically design them to have any sequence that you like. Okay. Um, the way this generally works is if you have a particular plasmid and you want to add a gene of interest to it, maybe a gene that you got from another organism, you use enzymes that essentially do cut and paste. right? So uh, by cutting the, this plasmid through these so-called restriction enzymes, now you have your gene of interest. And then you use other enzymes called ligases, which essentially paste this back together into the plasmid. And now you have your gene in the location that you want it. Right? You can even have these synthesized for you. Right? You don't have to do it yourself. But using this approach, it's possible to change the genetic structure. And in doing so, now you can add the genes that you think are necessary to produce the proteins that then interact with each other to perform a certain function. Now, this particular plasmid that we built in our lab has two genes in it, essentially um, one that uh, codes for LAC I, which is fused to a red fluorescent protein, and another one which, is which, uh, which expresses uh, this other protein 
called uh, ERA-C, which is fused to green fluorescent protein. And I think this is the one for the green one, this is the one for the red one. And when the cell, cell's own machinery expresses those two proteins that I have synthetically introduced, essentially what will happen is that the cell will make these two proteins, but I've picked them in such a way that these proteins interact with each other uh, in exactly the right way that they perform the function of a closed loop feedback system. Right? So this is, this is how this works. So in this particular case, the ERA-C acts as an activator for the second gene, right? And the second gene produces uh, like I that acts as a repressor for the first gene. And so this way I have a negative feedback circuit, you see? So all I needed to come up with this negative feedback circuit, I say all I need is actually a lot of work to put these things together, but essentially what you need to do is you need to have these, um, these genes that interact with each other uh, in a way that is uh, uh, predict predictable. Okay, and of course we can have chemical inducers that allow us to modulate the amount of repression so we can use that as a set point generator. So what can you manipulate in your genome? You can manipulate various sites. This allows you to change the transcription rate, degradation rate, translation rate. You can put a, a fluorescent reporter as I showed you before. You can adjust the protein degradation rate and so on. Now the thing about this technology is that it is really more an art than it is science. So in electrical engineering, if I want a resistor with you know, 10 kilo ohms, I just go there, I pick the right resistor, and I know it will have that resistance, right? Or if I need a capacitor, one microfarad, again, the same way. It's not the same here. So what I could do is I can roughly increase transcription rate or maybe increase translation rate, but I don't really know exactly by how much or what is the right sequence to include to increase it by a factor of two. There's a lot of trial and error involved in this. Okay, people try to make it more rational, but it's still uh, not, it's certainly not a deterministic process. It, worse still, every time you make a single change, it takes a week to implement it, right? So imagine if you're doing MATLAB, and every time you have to change one parameter, double a parameter, it takes a week before you get to see the result of your, of your output. So it's really a very laborious process. And it, when, it, comparing to, let's say, the standard numerical simulations that we do, this is progressing at a geological time scale, I would say. <laughs> uh, and, and so you really want to be able to come up with circuits that are very robust from the beginning. That's why these projects could take months or years just to have a functioning design. Okay, so um, I, I now would like to tell you a little bit about how you could use this technology to engineer integral feedback control systems. And uh, which is really the one application that I will focus on for the remainder of, of this talk. Um, now in designing this control system, I would like an objective. The control objective in this case is perfect adaptation. Um, by that we mean basically uh, robust steady state tracking. Right. So imagine, for example, a process here that is subjected to an external disturbance with an output of interest. We say this process achieves perfect adaptation if after the disturbance comes in, you have a, a transient and then the output goes back to the pre-disturbance level even though the disturbance is still there. Okay? So in control terms, we call this zero steady state, uh, in this case, disturbance rejection. Similarly, when the disturbance decreases. And uh, com contrast this with another process that does not achieve this robust perfect adaptation where the output will change but it doesn't recover uh, after the disturbance is added. Okay. okay, so in biology, robust perfect adaptation has been observed in many natural systems. Uh, here's one example uh, where you have os osmotic shock. You add salt to these yeast cells, the nuclear concentration of hog goes up but then it goes back to the pre-disturbance level regardless of the salt concentration. Similarly, the way bacteria chemotaxis, uh, the way bacteria moves in its environment, they respond to uh, different levels of, um, um, let's say, nutrient concentration, uh, but they always go back to the pre-disturbance level regardless of the level of the nutrients. And finally, one example from our own research, we looked at how us, we mammals, uh, regulate blood calcium concentration. One of the things you will notice that your blood calcium will be about 
milligrams per deciliter, uh, and it's very, very tightly regulated. And it's important that it's tightly regulated around this level because calcium is necessary for muscle function, it's necessary for nerve function, blood coagulation, lots of signaling. And so we have evolved a lot of mechanisms, feedback mechanisms, that actually maintain this calcium concentration in spite of large disturbances that will try to move it one way or another. And um, now, if you're a control engineer, at this point, you're thinking one thing. Uh, the only way to get this zero steady state error after this constant disturbance is if you have a, an integrator. Exactly. So you have, you have to have an integrator right? So in the feedback loop. And so we, uh, uh, in the case of calcium, we went back and we looked for uh, an integrator. And we found it in the forms of two hormones and the way they interact with each other. And so that was, uh, gave us integral feedback. And of course, in engineering, we have lots of examples of perfect adaptation. So I have this one that I built myself with Lego robots. I would like to show you. I'm very proud of my little toy. It's for 11-year-olds plus, so that I'm, I'm in the plus part. <laughs> so here's the, the robot. So what this robot does is it tries to maintain a distance of 30 centimeters from any object in front of it. Okay. So I'll show you the demo. Um, all right, so this is what it looks like, very simple, $150, you can get the whole kit. And it has four wheels, equal size, and it has an ultrasonic sensor, so it can uh, measure the speed, of, uh, takes the speed of sound, and then uses it to calculate distance. So you can see it tries to track exactly 30 centimeters. And it does this every single time, right? So here. Okay, now I'm going to, this is a, a bit long, so I'm going to move uh, forward a little bit. I'm going to change uh, some of the variables. So I can add mass to the robot. In this case, I'm going to change the uh, size of the wheels. Let's see if I can, ah, no, sorry. <coughs> I'm going to change the size of the wheels uh, in a second and, uh, and see what happens. Okay, right about now. So uh, with the larger wheels, the parameters have changed, right? And you can see the front wheels are bigger. And now the controller, the, the robot is much more aggressive. It's slipping, it's doing all kinds of things. It's moving faster. It's even oscillating a little bit around the, the fix. So there's a little bit of an overshoot before it settles, as you can see. And in spite of that, when the steady state uh, is observed, it's also exactly 30 centimeters, right? So that's a, a very good example of uh, integral feedback in action. Those of you who are doing control engineering, of course, uh, this is old news. Um, but that's why we like and love integrators. And they're actually the, some of the best control strategies uh, that exist uh, for, for robustness, right? OK, so um, now we would like to build a system like this using synthetic biology. Right, using molecules. So we'd like to build an integrator that using, we don't have op amps, we don't have resistors, we don't have capacitors, we don't have wires inside the cell, but we have to build this mechanism that does integration by figuring out just the right way molecules interact with each other to implement a form of integration. So that's the challenge here, okay? And if we can do that, then we can have behavior like you see in this robot. So, uh, as a control theorist, I like to formulate uh, the problem from a robust control point of view. Uh, so here we have a network of interacting molecules, mRNAs, proteins, and so on. That's what I would like to control, right? Now, in synthetic biology, very often in biology in general, you don't know the players very well. You don't know the interactions very well. You don't know the parameters very well, right? So there's a lot of uncertainty. And it's also very noisy, as I showed you. So there's a lot of stochastic dynamics involved. And it, there are external disturbances. And in spite of that, we still would like to build a control system uh, using molecules that can regulate the variable of interest. So here, uh, I would like to come up with another set of chemical reactions uh, such that when I augment the two, I have a closed loop system. This is going to be my controller. This is the plant. And what does the control system do? Well, first of all, it achieves stability, closed loop stability. And in the case of stochastic dynamics, there's an equivalent notion called ergodicity. So the closed loop system must be ergodic. 
uh, we have a variable of interest, let's say this variable x sub n must track a set point that I decide, right? So I want x sub n to approach the reference r as t goes to infinity. That's tracking. And I want this to be achieved regardless of the fact that I don't know the parameters or I don't know the interactions. So that's robust tracking. Biologists call robust tracking, they call it robust perfect adaptation. We call it robust tracking in engineering, uh, but it's the same thing, right? So I, I want to come up with a controller such that when I, these are a set of reaction, such that when I combine them with this set of reaction, I have this behavior. Okay, and it must be robust. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce to you uh, one controller that will do the job. And it's a very, very simple controller. It has only two species, Z1 and Z2, yet to be determined, right? So there's just Z1 and Z2. And Z1 and Z2 will act like actuators and sensors, but they also act to close the feedback loop in a way I will show you next. All right, so here's a variable of interest, X sub n. Uh, here's the variable, the control input, x1. I want to wiggle x1 to control xn. So I have a molecule called z1, one of the two controller species that's produced at a constant rate, constitutively, uh, such that the amount of z1 will affect the amount of, x, uh, of x1, right? So the more z1 you have, the more x1 is being produced. Now, to have a sensor, I have another reaction. Uh, such that the rate of production of Z2, the second controller molecule, is dependent on the abundance of Xn. So the more Xn I have, the faster the rate of production of the second molecule, Z2. Right? So that's like a sensor. And now to close the feedback loop, I will request an, a third reaction. Now this is a very special reaction. It takes one molecule of Z1 with one molecule of Z2, and they have to react with each other so that the product is either annihilation of both or they can just be sitting together bound but biologically inactive, right? So that's, that's the condition. Let's just call it annihilation. And that's all I need. And one thing I want to show you is that this actually implements negative feedback uh, in the following way. Suppose here increasing x1 will lead to an increase in x sub n. Let's say x sub n reaches above its value uh, then you'll have uh, a faster rate for this reaction. You have more Z2. If you have more Z2, then because of this reaction, you'll have fewer molecules of Z1. Then this will bring down X1 down and will in, pro in the process bring X brings Xn down, right? So that will, will do the regulation. Now, one of the things you can show is that the average of the difference between Z1 and Z2 is equal to the integral of mu over theta minus the average of the variable of interest. And that's where the integral feedback comes in, you see? So uh, if you think about the system, let's assume this system is ergodic or stable, then this integral will be constant as a function of time after sufficiently high time. Now the only way this uh, integral will be constant is if the integrand goes to zero, right? The only way this integral will be constant is if the integrand goes to zero, and the integrand goes to zero only when this expectation approaches mu over theta. So then mu over theta is my reference, is r. That's the set point. It's just the ratio of this variable to this variable. And, and notice that this doesn't depend at all on the, on the variables in the plant. It doesn't depend on the topology of the plant. It doesn't depend on the reaction rates. It doesn't depend even on some of the other controller rates. It just depends on the set point, mu over theta. Now, this is in the steady state. The transient is another story. It will depend on all these parameters. But the steady state, because of this uh, integral formula, um, the only thing that matters is the ratio of mu and theta. Okay. So we call this controller antithetic integral control because these molecules act as antagonists for each other. And, um, and we claim that a lot of systems in biology actually uh, work this way. So you have two molecules, uh, for example, toxin, antitoxin, sigma, anti-sigma, and so on. They bind with each other in exactly this way. And if they're in a feedback loop, then they're implementing this antithetic integral control. And you, one can do simulations to see that indeed this is the case. So these are Monte Carlo simulations. The dashed line is the reference, and you can see that the output of interest follows this reference. Um, so here is the, if you change a parameter, Kp, 
you double it, let's say at time 25, you see that after a transient, short transient, the output uh, follows the reference, whereas all of these other variables uh, assume different values, but they do that in just the right way so that the output of interest follows the set point. And same for gamma p, same for gamma r, so it's really uh, robust. The single cells can be very noisy, right? So you can see these are the trajectories for single cells. However, at the population level, the population average will be exactly where it needs to be. Even at the single cell level, if you look at the time average, it will also approach the right value, r, mu over theta, right? because of ergodicity. Um, but you don't really need the single cell to be well behaved for the population to be well behaved. And even more still, the species that are involved, Z1 and Z2, can be very, very small, few copy numbers. So in this case, this is going between zero and one molecules per cell. Um, and yet, uh, you can do a very good job with control. So with one molecule or a few molecules, you can do a good job controlling the behavior. Really, I mean, this shouldn't be a surprise because control is not about material, it's not about energy. Control is about information processing, right? And this is acting kind of like a pulse width modulation to do the regulation. Okay, now uh, I want to just give you a very uh, brief description of this controller and it's a special property of this controller, which is its universality. The question arises, okay, I showed you one controller that works, might there be other topologies that will do the same job? Maybe there are other reactions, other set of reactions that will do exactly the same robust perfect adaptation. So if we have a, a candidate controller like this one, and if we had a sensing actuation and a reference point that leaves a lot of degrees of freedom into what the controller itself does, it could have tens or hundreds of species. Um, but this controller, let's say, have n, m species, and we're going to assume we have closed loop stability of the system. And as before, we will call this robust perfectly adapting if, uh, if you have a, if a, in the steady state, this average value of xn approaches mu over theta regardless of the parameters, then one comes up with this very interesting result. And this result essentially characterizes all controllers that achieve this robust perfect adaptation. Okay? And, and what this says is that a controller achieves robust perfect adaptation if and only if there is, exists a vector in the nef, left null space of the stoichiometry matrix of the controller such that the first entry is one, the second entry is negative one, right? So this is, and, and Q transpose S is equal to zero. So that gives you an algebraic condition that allows you to parameterize all stabilizing controllers that achieve robust perfect adaptation, and uh, regardless of their order. And one can unravel this more to say that every controller that uh, satisfies this condition or achieves robust perfect adaptation must embed an antithetic controller within it. Okay, so there must, this antithetic motif must be present somewhere. And what that means is that any controller that has this property, the species can be partitioned into three different subsets, C0, C plus, C minus, and C0. And there has to be one chemical reaction that takes a molecule from C plus together with the molecules from C minus and brings it to a molecule in C0. That's what I mean by it must embed this robust perfect, uh, this antithetic motif. So this is kind of like an internal model principle for integral control at the molecular scale, right? So it, it, it's an internal model principle that tells you this uh, reaction has to be there, but it also gives you all controllers that will achieve this adaptation so that you can use this other degree of freedom to design the transient response without having to worry about the steady state tracking property being violated. So as long as you have that reaction, you can use the other degrees of freedom to do other things on top of that, maybe faster response, shorter rise time, and so on. So it's kind of like, has a similar flavor to what we do in robust control, like the Euler parameterization, for example. Okay, now uh, the last few minutes I have, um, I would like to show you how we build this controller. A and this is a process that took a good part of two, two and a half years. So what I will just tell you in five to ten minutes. <laughs> um, so how do we do it? So here's just to give you 
a conceptual idea, and I want you now to remember the first part of my talk, where I said, you know, how one can genetically engineer these genes. So here we have three genes. Uh, we have a gene that we want to control, that's our plant. Let's say it produces a protein, but this gene is controlled by a protein, which is the product of another gene, Z1. And uh, Z1 and Z2, those two proteins, they bind together to give you, uh, to annihilate. And of course, the output itself uh, affects the production of this gene Z2, okay? So the, I'm going to put names to these genes. RSC is the one you want to control. SIGW and RSI, this would be Z1, this would be Z2 in the previous notation. And uh, now, remember I have mu and theta, and it's the ratio of mu and theta that give you the set point, where here mu is uh, some chemical inducer that I can add to my cells, it's called HSL, and theta is another chemical inducer, it's a sugar called arabinose, and according to the theory, the ratio of the HSL concentration and arabinose in my solution, that should dictate the set point for my genetic circuit. Okay, now in order to see the output, I have to fuse this, or at least introduce another fluorescent tag, so that I can look at how much RSC is being made, see if it's actually being controlled. And in order to test the disturbance rejection of this feedback circuit, I introduce yet another gene which acts like a disturbance. So this other gene, you know, codes for a protease, that's a protein that degrades other proteins, and this protease is called MFLON. So MF lon will degrade anything with this degradation tag, which is basically my output. And now MF lon is not always there. I can turn it on or off on demand by adding a third chemical inducer called ATC. Okay? So without ATC, I have no disturbance. The circuit's still functioning. As soon as I add ATC to my solution, that's a disturbance that signals this gene to produce this protease that will chew up the protein output. And now if my circuit is working as an integrator, uh, it should correct for the degradation of this protein and it should start, it should increase the rate of RSC so that in the steady state it should be exactly the same, right? Otherwise I don't have perfect adaptation. So uh, there are a, lot, a few more details. So this is what the actual circuit looks like. It has actually seven genes, six promoters and two plasmid. But essentially it's what I told you it does. And then we have another circuit to compare to, which is the same, but without the feedback. That's the open loop, right? All right, so here are some results. So as you increase mu or HSL, you can see the darker the green, the higher the output. So these are experimental results. So this is increasing with HSL exactly as it should. The arabinose goes uh, inverse proportionally to the protein expression, so the more arabinose you add, the fewer proteins you have, and indeed, that's what you see. So these are some step responses for the genetic circuit that I have uh, for different concentrations of mu and theta, so different uh, set points. Uh, none of this does disturbance rejection, by the way. This is just step response. Now, to test the disturbance rejection properties of the system, I have to add the disturbance. Okay, and here is the plot that shows it. So in red, you see the output at steady state before the disturbance is added for the closed loop circuit. So that's the closed loop. Now in blue, you see the output in the steady state with the disturbance, right? And you can see that they're identical. And that's the same regardless of the various set points here that I've introduced. Now if you look at what happens with the same exact disturbance, but now applied to the open loop, you can see that without the disturbance, this is the same output. With the disturbance here, the output lost 40% of its value at steady state. So there's clearly no adaptation here. And now in the time domain, which is uh, I think more natural for us to look at, uh, you can see this more clearly. The only problem is you, these experiments take a very, very long time. You know, they take maybe 10 to 12 hours for each, each run and you need triplicates and then you need to be diluting every half an hour manually, so it's, they're very lab laborious. Uh, but they do tell you what happens in the time domain. And what you can see in red here is that's the output without the disturbance. When you turn on the disturbance ATC here, and you can look at the blue trace, you see that initially there's a small drop 
and then a recovery, and then the output goes back to its pre-disturbance level in steady state, uh, whereas in the open loop, the output loses about 40% of its value and never recovers. Okay? So there's a clear demonstration that this circuit actually does achieve robust perfect adaptation. And uh, finally, I think this I'm getting close to the end of my talk. Um, instead of controlling a fluorescent protein, in this case, we control an enzyme called MET-E. So MET-E is uh, needed for methionine production. Methionine is an essential amino acid. It's required for growth. So what we do in this experiment is we remove methionine from the medium and we make the production of MET-E subject to our circuit. So our circuit is the only way you, the cell will get um, methionine. And the idea is that by modulating the production of MET-E, we can modulate the growth rate. And this is exactly what you see. So by changing mu, you can see that the growth rate can be changed. Now, if you take our circuit uh, that controls growth now, not GFP, and then change the temperature. So this is a global disturbance. And you, if you go from 37 degrees to 30 degrees, everything changes in the cell, right? If you, if those of you who do uh, biotechnology know that this is a drastic disturbance in the production of a large number of genes. And in, in our circuit, the growth rate remains unchanged, whereas the circuit without uh, the feedback, you see the growth rate drops by more than 60 percent. Okay. Okay. Uh, finally, I just want to sh say that uh, if you want to know more about this, there was this article that just came out last week about our work in Quanta Magazine, and what Quanta Magazine is a really nice magazine. It, 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 it describes complex ideas in a very accessible way. So in this in this article, they they describe actually not just the science, but also the story behind the science and the scientists and how it works. So they go back 20 years. Um, you know, if you have 15, 20 minutes and you want to learn more about what I just told you, I think this would be uh, a good article to read. So math reveals the secrets of cell feedback. So, okay, sounds good. <laughs> um, in conclusion, I want to tell you that there is now an emerging theory for rationally designed synthetic control systems. It's not that old. It's been around only for 10 years or so. Uh, but I think there's an increasing number of people working on it. And I have to say that unlike a lot of the other activities that go on in synthetic biology, much of this theory is being driven by, th much of this design methods are being driven by theory, which I think is, is very good. Um, so in this case, I showed you that robust perfect adaptation requires integral feedback and that if you have noisy dynamics, the only way to achieve this integral feedback is to apply this antithetic uh, motif. Um, again, I cannot overemphasize this enough. So in this case, um, the design was informed by theory. And, and, and because of that, the design topology, the controller topology, was quite, was quite unobvious. In fact, we had spent two years before that working on another design that failed spectacularly. And when we came up with this antithetic motif based on theoretical consideration and built it, that turned out to be the successful design. So I, I think this is in contrast to a lot of what happens in synthetic biology where there's a lot of trial and error. Uh, but in this case, I think I would like to make a, a case for rational design that's based on solid theoretical foundation. Um, so, um, again, if there's one point you need to take from this lecture is that the main advantage of feedback is robustness. Whether you're working with biology or with engineering or with any other system. If you didn't have any needs for robustness, there is no point in having negative feedback. It's just simply unnecessary and it just adds more complexity. The only requirement, the only advantage of, of, of uh, um, negative feedback is robustness. In this case, it allowed us to reject uh, perturbations and parameter variations. Uh, but in the case of synthetic biology, when designs are very expensive, they're very time consuming and very frustrating, you don't want your control design to depend on the parameters or the specifics or the topology of the process you're trying to control. Right? So in that case, it's even more important to have a structural result that says if you have the right controller structure built with these molecules, 
the exact parameters don't matter. It's the structure that matters, and it's the structure that lets you come up with the uh, correct output, right, or the desired result. And you don't need to worry about the details of the plot. This is also true in engineering, of course, but it's even more so in biology because there's so much uncertainty. And many of these processes we would like to control, the science behind the process is not well understood. And so uh, that brings me to the last slide. I just want like to acknowledge some of the people who did the work. Um, the theory, theoretical part of uh, what I described to you, the antithetic motif, was uh, done by two very talented postdocs, Ankit Gupta, uh, let's see, uh, this guy who is still in my group, and Corentin Bria. And then the experiments uh, on all of the blood, sweat, and tears that went with those experiments were done by uh, Gabriele, uh, sorry, Gabriele Lacci and Stephanie Aoki with help from uh, Armin um, uh, Baumschlager and David Schweingruber. Uh, thank you very much for listening, and I think hopefully we have some time for questions. Thank you. So maybe talking about quantum sensing effect or something like that, that will probably introduce a delay mm -hmm. for the signal. Mm -hmm. Would affect the response of the system, or is still a robust also to this particular kind of? Yeah. Okay, uh, it's a good question. I mean, there's lots of uh, aspects of your question. Uh, first of all, this is being done. Uh, it's being attempted by. Maybe it hasn't been demonstrated yet, but it's being attempted by two, at least two groups that I know, Mario Di Bernardo and uh, Richard Merrick's group. Um, now, the answer to your question is, so the question of perfect adaptation is a steady state result. So delay may make things take longer, but so long as the closed loop system is stable, so your delay doesn't destabilize your closed loop, then yes, it will work. The danger when you introduce additional delay is that you may lose ergodicity and then all bets are off. So, so long as your delay is not too large so that you still have stability, you would, you would still have this. And of course, there are advantages to the doing it the way you're describing because you're using different strains, so you don't overburden the cells and so on. Each strain is doing its own thing, but then you have to communicate through mo diffusing molecules like worm sensing or other means. And that's also challenging. Uh, we can uh, thank uh, Mustafa for his presentation. If you have any question, he would be here this afternoon. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.